morning. Good morning. So Sam and I obviously know each other, and we spent some time discussing his absolutely splendid book. And in our encounters with each other and talking about Francis Coppola, since each of us have a different history, to say the least, with Francis, we found that though we got along amiably and became friends, our attitudes uh, uh, toward the material, toward Francis and so forth, were, were different as based on our own particular experiences. Um, and there was one scene in, in Sam's uh, superb book which stands out to me as sort of a symbol of the way in which our perceptions of Francis Copeland uh, differ. And uh, that would be epitomized by a little clip that we could show. Gary, do, do we have that lined up? Why don't we run the clip and then I can explain the context. We need to create an opera in order to successfully do a movie. That that brings out the best in your work. Do you feel that that's a valid description of your, of your operating style, or is it mythology? I think there's some truth to this. I, I build a situation that's ambitious, but it, it, if I don't succeed, I will be destroyed. So you, you tend to struggle as hard as you can. A quick little story. Uh, well, my dad was a, he was a great flutist, and uh, he played the Toscanini when he was a young man. And then there was a passage on the flute that went very difficult areas. And at the end, my father went to the maestro and said, tell me, why did you write that for flute? Why did you write it for piccolo? It's in its range. He said, because I wanted you to strain for it. <laughs> and, and that's the story, you know, that, and that's partly the story of my life. Then there's a beautiful uh, poem from Robert Burns. I, I always get it wrong, but if a man's grasp doesn't exceed his reach, what's a heaven's for? In other words, you should always try to do something, reach for something you can't quite grasp. <laughs> That's from Shootout, Peter's show with Peter Goober, the greatest te television show ever about the movies. <laughs> it's true. So anyway, I thought that epitomized the fact that with, with, with Francis, every movie uh, becomes an instant opera. And to me, as I said that, started to say, there's a scene in, in Sam's book, which I'd love you to talk about, where it's, they have shot basically all of Apocalypse. And it's time to shoot the final scene. And the star of the final scene, of course, is Marlon Brando. So Brando arrives on time. And the deal is simply three weeks at a million dollars a week, as I recall. And typical of Marlon Brando, who's a good friend of mine, he is 100 pounds overweight has not read the script, and has not read the book upon which the script is based. So acting with true 60s irresponsibility, Brando arrives and says, so I'm here to shoot the final scene. He didn't say at a million a week, but that was clearly the subtext. Uh, and where do we go from here? Now, I only raise that for this reason, that to me, a, it's a symbol of the, the raison d'etre, the method of operating in 60s and 70s Hollywood, that a, a degree of genius surrounded by a sense of total irresponsibility. So that to me was, is one of the really interesting and strong pieces of your book that shows something about the subject. But You've talked, did you ever talk to Brando about that? I know you talked in no, great sense no, to Brando, Francis. Yeah, Brando is gone. Brando is gone, yeah. And how did Francis feel about the way that scene was done and constructed? Well, it's not unlike the way Francis works with all actors, um, which is wildly improvisational or and or irresponsible. Um, um, and, uh, but Francis talks about Brando with total reverence. There's no place in Francis's relationship with Brando that, that, that allows for 
criticism. He regards him not just as a great actor the way that we all do, but he also thought Brando was a bona fide genius. Um, he said he's actually one of the only men he's ever met about whom he's certain um, he is a genius. Um, so I, I think a lot of that is, is true. Brando had a great mind and a really playful, um, free mind. And also Francis, growing up in the 50s, uh, was an idol of Brando's. Um, and so didn't quite, doesn't, never quite could distance himself from, as he couldn't with his own father, the perfect image of, of the, father, the father figure. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there was a little bit of enabling going on, a little bit of awe. And also, um, Francis didn't have the ending to Apocalypse. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and so uh, he was rewriting it throughout the entire movie and kept pushing that last scene to the very end of production as a way to delay and also as a way to allow himself to discover the ideas of good and evil, which is what the movie was about. The way <coughs> Francis makes movies, which does not make this convenient for Peter's, Peter's end, the studio, Francis needs to discover the movie within himself. He needs to live the movie off camera. He's like a method actor, but a director. I think he's a method director. Now, this is very expensive. This is very cumbersome and very irresponsible. Um, uh, when you're dealing with millions of dollars, schedules, helicopters, typhoons, um, Peter Bart, <laughs> Bob Evans, <laughs> real things and people who are saying, come on, let's go. Francis pumps the brakes as long as he possibly can. Mm -hmm. Now, the, 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 the good end of that is when you get something like Apocalypse Now. Um, uh, the bad end of that is when you don't. <laughs> and Francis many times did not. Mm -hmm. um, more times he did not than, than he did. Um, but I, Peter, I think you should explain to people who don't know or maybe don't realize what your job was um, because that helps to explain your point of view on, on Francis. Yeah. Well, Francis and I d disagreed very strongly on the issue of what is a studio, and should there be a studio? Now, I have been an executive of four of them, so I have some f familiarity with the modus operandi. And here's the big disagreement. I am stupidly of that school that says, before we start shooting, we should have a budget. What? A schedule. No. <laughs> <laughs> actors, too? A script. Actors. Afterwards, <laughs> yeah. the terrible thing is we all know that once you have the script, sometimes you cast it and you realize you've miscast it. So from the start, Francis was following a, a modus operandi which bothered me in particular because he was a role model. And um, the way I wanted to operate, uh, even starting at Paramount, was a whole different way, where you really start with a story. You start even with a book, and you buy the rights to that story and the book, and then you hire a writer, a real writer, not just a director who thinks he's a writer. And you get a script based on that property. Then you find a director who is willing to actually work on that story. Now, from the start, with Francis, typically, even on The Godfather, the idea of working on a best-selling book was horrendous to him because the story was there and this brilliant writer Mario Puzo understood this story. So Francis had to go in and accept a whole series of situations which inhibited exactly the trades that you were saying. Mm -hmm because you couldn't then start from scratch and change the third act. Right. You were stuck with it. Now, stupid people like me say, God, isn't that wonderful? You actually know what you're getting into. <laughs> with Francis, however, and from the start, you know, we, Francis and I disliked each other from day one when I first <laughs> met him. And to this day, if, we, if he was here, 
he would hug us both because yes. he's a very warm, yes. loving man and a good daddy. Yes. But a horrible director to work with. <laughs> a now, horrible director. To work with. To work with, yeah. I get that. Now, does, when he was working with you on this book, and you are a great, a brilliant questioner. That's nice. To what you, degree did he admit openly that he simply doesn't like the idea of a script and a structure and everything laid out like that? He didn't have to admit it because it was understood mm -hmm. um, that, that, you know, it, it, Francis is, he, 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 he's not, he's not closeted about his process, so it wasn't anything that I had to get him to um, confess to. Right. Um, he, um, he it, it's, it is the, maybe the most fascinating thing about the movies, and makes movies different from all other, all other f art forms, is the amount of money that's at stake. Mm -hmm. um, so it's always a question, it's always a, a push and pull, you know, um, would it serve the studio? If, if you are in Peter's position and your filmmaker comes up with a better idea that you think is going to cost more money but might make more money in the end, what do you do? Do you say yes, do you say yes or no? So um, it must be an improvisation on some level. Otherwise, you're, you're saying no to the possibility of learning or good ideas happening to you as, as you go along. Now, have, have many folks here seen Apocalypse Now in recent years? Yeah. Yes. So there is that whole section of his intersection with Sheen. Yes. Where he really, and your book describes it vividly, he sets about to destroy Sheen, yeah. Sheen as a person. He gave him basically a nervous breakdown. Yes. In, in, in the attack. interest of art. Yes. Now, is this beyond the pale for just the relationship between two human beings? Yes. Uh, yes. Um, um, it, it, it wouldn't be the way I would make the movie, you know? I, I, I don't think you need to have actors lose their minds to be great. I mean, Gary Cooper's pretty great, and he, you know, yeah. there's a lot of actors who do the job and do a great job. They don't need to have a meltdown on screen. Um, so I think that's a weakness of Francis's most definitely. I mean, it's like the famous story between Hoffman and, and Olivier, you know, uh, um, and Olivier just said, you know, why don't you try acting? Um, Dustin's trying to live, live it, you know, make it real, make it, why don't you just act? Um, uh, so there is, a, there is a part of that for sure. Um, um, but you are friendly with Dustin. I am now, friendly now with Dustin. Dustin yeah. can get there without being torn apart. Isn't yes. that true? Yes, well, technique is what you're talking about. Right. And an actor should have technique, and a director should have technique, and Francis doesn't have technique mm -hmm. as a director. Mm -hmm. um, he, I think one of the reasons um, Godfather is so strong is because he was forced by Gordon Willis to make decisions about where the camera goes. Right. And... Uh, um, it not, less so with Storaro, uh, who would, would be able to move the camera, much more comfortable with camera movement, allows you to hide technique sometimes. Mm -hmm. With Gordon Willis, he's so stringent and his grammar so rigorous that he says, we, are gonna, we know what this shot is about. What is this shot about? We are going to pick exactly the right spot for this camera and light it perfectly. It's classical. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. It's classical. And that forced Francis into a technique that you don't see in his, in his other movies. Yeah. But again, away from my different point of view, um, the whole interaction of Gordon Willis and Francis was fascinating. In the sense, Gordon Willis is, a, most cinematographers are really interesting personalities. Mm. Gordon Willis is a terrible person. Yes, yeah, no one liked Gordon Willis. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so they, when Gordon and Francis decided that in shooting The Godfather, 
it would be in very dark textures, that they, that, that they would make it basically as dark and moody as they could. So they shot two weeks of The Godfather without telling anybody in, quote, management that this was their intent. So therefore, crisis number one, two weeks into the film, um, Bob Evans and I are the only people who see dailies. Every day, but Evans turns to me and, and actually Stanley Jaffe, I think, was there and saw the dailies. And they were unspeakably dark. And we all thought that we had sunglasses on. So True, Jaffe? True? You remember that? Yes? <laughs> Nodding yes. Yep. So, so it could have been that Francis and Storaro could have said, before you see dailies, you should know this is our intent. There was no such conversation. No, well, they didn't want to hear no. So that caused op act one of the opera that Francis was talking about. Right. Now, is that necessarily an, a way you have to do business? No, it's not. <laughs> it's not. But Francis was, Francis had been burned by uh, Warner Brothers in the first incarnation of Zoetrope, his production company. Um, and dream for the studio of the future, Warners had burned Francis deeply. And so he came to Paramount uh, with, um, what can we say, wounds still, still bleeding. Um, yeah. And um, uh, uh, th thought, well, you know, in an adversarial way, how am I going to handle this? And also, because Francis lives the movie, that he's making, he becomes Michael um, as he is making The Godfather. Um, and that doesn't just mean creating a family off camera to match the family on camera, although he does do that, but he is learning to come into his power. And the way that's acted out, um, this is not conscious, but I, it happens on Francis movie after Francis movie, so it's true. Uh, the way that's acted out, is by going head to head or sub or or in a, in a, in a, in a I guess undercover way with the bosses, um, um, Peter and um, Evans, and always in a very gracious way. I mean, the, and we're talking about personalities. Francis Coppola, a gentle and in many ways a loving man. So your arguments with him are not angry, mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're the opposite of angry. The disagreements are peculiar because they're strong, but said in almost an affectionate way. Mm. Francis can actually say in a loving way, you are full of shit. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> and that's part of what makes Francis a great producer, I think a better producer than even a director. I know that that's actually, yeah. we might agree on that one. Mm -hmm. um, um, and that's part of what the book is, is Francis the producer. So uh, let me ask you yes, this question. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, much of your writing about Francis describes vividly his great ambition to start his own studio. Right. To really reinvent the studio system around his peculiar concepts. Now, you know, I always felt that his idea of what a studio should be was crazed. But as he explained it to you, he has never backed off for a minute. Explain what a, what a, a Francis studio is. Well, I, Francis, obviously, as, as we've demonstrated here, there is a push and pull about money and creativity and freedom, which is a healthy one. Um, uh, Francis wanted the pull to favor the artist completely. Um, you can see the problem. Uh, but you can also see the dream. Um, and uh, Francis uh, uh, put everything into this dream to the degree that it really was his life's project, um, going back to the time when he was a little boy, um, all the way through today. He envisions a studio um, not just as a place where artists run, f run free, maybe irresponsibly, um, but also as a plan for the community of the future. There is a utopian aspect, very explicitly utopian aspect, to Francis's vision of the studio. What is a studio? It is a place where the most talented people in the world of all different kinds of 
abilities come together and collaborate. It's not just filmmakers, it's designers, it's producers, um, it's um, uh, uh, photographers, uh, salesmen and women. Um, <laughs> and it, it takes this village of the world's best to make the greatest thing in the world, which is, which is a movie. It's not true of every other art form where you have all, where you have this interdisciplinary, um, this interdisciplinary aspect, this communal aspect of creation. And so I think you explained it very well, with one exception. Yes. And that is that he basically set up that studio three different times. Yes. And in each time, it ended up in a bloodbath. Uh, oh, lost, that detail. Lost, <laughs> <laughs> lost money, lost souls. Yeah. Uh, and, and in other words, conceptually, we're dealing with a man who three times established a company his way, three times lost, but if he was alive today, he would try it again. Wouldn't he, he is. Well, and in fact, Megalopolis, the movie that Francis has just made now with 140 of his own millions, um, is about the city of the future. And um, this is going to be his last testament. He said that, uh, and um, it's the it is the story of his life. Mm -hmm. It brings up the question, if something ends in disaster, does that mean it was a failure? Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, it could. It, it, it could. Um, uh, on the other hand, utopia, as we know, means the place from nowhere. Or as we don't know, as I didn't know until Francis told me. Uh, utopia means the place from nowhere. Utopia doesn't exist but it must constantly be in the conversation. It must constantly be attempted as a model to push us towards the best. So Sam, as you know, after the, the Godfather, one Francis, was rewarded with an entity called the Director's Company. Now, the Director's Company was the director's dream. Three directors, Friedkin, Bogdanovich, and Francis, working together, they would all have to agree um, with every picture before it got made, and they would also own the picture. They had to agree. That part I didn't know. They had yeah. to agree. They okay. had all three had to agree. Okay. And then they would own it. They were a final cut, creative control. It was going to be another of Francis's exercises in artistic harmony. And of course, guess what? The director's company was a disaster. Francis made a picture called A Conversation. Not a disaster. Not a disaster, yeah. but when he finished shooting a picture, he had no idea how to put it together. Yes, that's true. And he had a friend who sort of someone had, a, a man who had a difficult life thereafter named George Lucas. And George Lucas... <laughs> George Maybe Lucas, they haven't heard of him. <laughs> George Lucas came in and fixed his picture. Yeah. God love him. But the... the and Walter... <clears throat> Walter Murch, the great editor, of course. Yeah, exactly. And then the second picture, which Stanley Jaffe and I actually donated to the director's company, it was called Paper Moon. Thank you. And Paper Moon, Paper Moon was was um, was uh, directed by Peter Bogdanovich, and was a success. And then the next picture was Billy was Peter doing a movie starring his. Um, uh, then girlfriend, Sybil Shepherd, and uh, based on, I think it was an 18th century novel by, uh, I forget who. Daisy Miller. Daisy Miller. Henry right. James. That was, that's right, Henry yes. James. Yeah. And so, um, uh, so fr Francis and told, um, I was technically the president of the director's company, told me about it, and I said, I thought it's a terrible idea, but I don't have veto power. He then gave it to Billy Friedkin, who just died a few weeks ago. He was a wonderful man. But Billy operated in a different way. He said, there's no way I'm going to approve that picture. You're doing it for your girlfriend. And the, as an idea for a picture, it stinks. And I veto it. Whereupon Peter went and shot it anyway, yeah. and Billy quit the director's company, and the whole company blew up. My only point being, this was a typical to me Francis studio-type project, which self-destructed. 
<laughs> yeah, well, it, it, there, there was um, a problem also in the director's company that m I think accounted for its self-destruction that was not creative. I believe that all of the filmmakers shared in each other's hits. Right. Financially. Yes. So it meant that Billy Friedkin had a stake in Daisy Miller being a very bad idea. Right. Um, to which Bogdanovich said, uh, Friedkin, where's your movie? And Friedkin, in fact, never did deliver. Um, so I thought they had a, f a fair fight on that one. One wonders if it could have gone on without that profit sharing aspect mm -hmm. of it. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. But I, Peter, think it was such a beautiful thing that this even was ex attempted. And, and look what came out of it. I mean, two masterpieces, mm -hmm. Paper Moon, The Conversation, and one dud mm -hmm. uh, is a great, great record. Uh, so, uh, did, Talk to us about an experience you just went through where you showed an audience uh, what to me is an epitome of Francis's work. It was a movie called One from the Heart, which he recut at least 10 times after finishing it and probably is still he, we He just screened the new cut. That's what it was. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And now explain. You showed it at the Egyptian to an audience. Yes. How was it accepted? Um, with... Uh, uh, affection, derision, and confusion. <laughs> um, and uh, no, this is a movie that, who has seen one from the heart? Yeah, Berger, yeah. Um, a friend once asked me what I thought from this movie. I say there's two answers to that question. I like it and I don't like it. <laughs> yeah. um, it, it, it's, a, it, it's a movie made with a lot of love that is pretty sterile. Mm -hmm. um, so depending on where you are on that spectrum uh, is, is what you'll think of, of the movie. So, But do you believe that Francis Coppola, who was a really good father, yeah. was a wonderful father, do you think that he's incapable of doing a movie about the, a romantic relationship between a man and a woman? Well, yes, and this is one of the things that um, because Francis lives the movie, you know, he, he a, after the, the catastrophe, the emotional catastrophe of Apocalypse, which is a story famously told by the fabulous documentary Heart of Darkness, Hearts of Darkness, which you must go out and see if you haven't seen, um, where you really get to see Francis's breakdown happening on camera, um, and his marriage falling apart. He lived it. He became Colonel Kurtz. Um, and yeah. when I even spoke to someone in his office who said that his, um, his, the name on his lithium prescription was Colonel Kurtz. <laughs> Fact. Um, um, so after that, uh, he, he decided his next movie had to be a love story. Um, he needed to figure out love um, and keep his marriage together um, and needed to live that. Uh, um, and didn't. Yeah. Um, and I think the results of his failing to understand what that was, it's a story about a couple that breaks up and comes back together. And the coming back together is not convincing. Nor is Eleanor and Francis's coming back together, and they're still married, convincing. I must say, um, having interviewed both of them and spent time with them, um, I did ask Eleanor, you know, what's the secret to a long marriage? And she said, don't get divorced. Yeah. Um, I, and she, she is a, uh, a truly lovely woman. Yes, who and a great writer. Not. I mean, her book Notes about the making of Apocalypse is one of the best books ever about the making of a movie and really poetic. Anyhow, Francis does not get man-woman love, and neither... Um, neither does anyone else in his generation of filmmakers. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the filmmaker, except for Bogdanovich, um, Bogdanovich gets it, um, but we don't see from um, Friedkin, Lucas, Spielberg, 
Scorsese, um, um, I think that pretty much says it. De Palma, um, uh, we don't see love stories from yeah. these guys. Mm -hmm. These guys who are the leaders of the next generation. Yes. You know, Paul Mazursky m made love stories, yeah. but you really have to move to the fringes. Woody Allen, obviously. You know, um, but the people who came to define th Hollywood were not makers of love stories, which is a huge shift from the f from what Hollywood was founded on. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the great characteristics of the Bart Evans reign is that Evans was always saying man woman stories. Mm -hmm. Evans always wanted man woman stories, and unfortunately. And Evans was always in love. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you think about Bart and Evans, what made them was a love story. Um, the, the, well, yes, yes, exactly, yeah. Um, now, Francis, one important trait that he exhibited in his recent years, I'd love you to, your observation about it, and that is he decided that he was going to make pictures purely for himself. The last, I think, three films that he made were basically, no one ever heard of them, and yeah. hardly anyone has ever seen them. Yeah. And I, I have never seen them. I actually saw half of one of them. And they are examples of a film that a great film makes purely for himself. Yes. So now, can you be a director, a director has to be one to communicate. Yes. He has to work for his audience. Yes. If in your head is that basic instinct that, screw him, in the end I'm going to make pictures for nobody but me, is that a trait that, that is totally antithetical to what a director should think? Yes, I completely, I completely agree with you, especially because this is a business. You are not in your room making a little canvas that's going to sit on your shelf that you need to make back and hopefully more the money that somebody else spent. Now in those later movies Francis can make movies for himself. He's pretty much writing his own check. Yeah. Francis made uh, all of his money on wine. Um, Francis became a billionaire on the wine, not the movies, and it bought him the right um, to um, go out and make tiny little movies that you don't want to see. Um, um, right. And that's his, that's his decision. You know, he, um, he is an experimenter, Francis. Mm -hmm. As I've mentioned, he loves to be in process, mm -hmm. and he loves to play and discover. And you can't do that so much within a studio. I think you need to do it somehow in a studio. Otherwise, you get what we have today with no play and discovery. This is bad. Um, what you really want is Peter Bart and Bob Evans being your bosses at the studio. Um, and being and, argumentative. And you want to no. be, be argumentative yeah. with sensitive, creative people. Yeah. Well, I believe that good movies result from conflict. They don't result from people wanting right. to be in love with another person. One thing I know, I and Stanley Jaffe was the same way. Neither of us ever particularly wanted to be loved in, in our work. But mm. let me ask you this, because you have spent time and ran The Graduate with Dustin recently. Yes. Yeah. Do, would Dustin and Francis have ever succeeded in working together? It's, it's a great question because Dustin is in Megalopolis, Francis's movie. I didn't know that. And they mm -hmm. got on because they're both improvisers. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> right. Dustin is famously uh, contentious with directors because directors um, have an idea in their heads. That's what they're paid to have. Mm -hmm. um, and Dustin you know, has an idea in his head. And he wants to say, just let me try it. Let's, let's play. Let's do it this way. And the director's saying, I, I got a lot of headaches to deal with. We already have a script. It's not time to rewrite it. So in a way, Dustin and, and Francis are really well suited to each other because they can go on and on and on and on <laughs> and on and on and on. And on. Um, so that was a very happy collaboration. 
And he had a good collaboration with Mike Nichols, who was not the easiest human being to work with either. Well, Dustin talks about how he did not, he had a good rehearsal period with Nichols for the very same reason, because in rehearsal you can discover. Mm -hmm. There's nothing that's been committed to. Mm -hmm. But once they got into production and Nichols got nervous for good reason, thinking I've, ca I've miscast this movie, that's right. which he did on purpose. <laughs> um, you know, right. it should have been Redford or yeah. a Redford type, right. um, which reminds me, Redford said uh, to Nichols they were playing pool, and Redford said, "So, uh, am I gonna? Are you? Am I gonna play this Benjamin character?" And Nichols said to him, "Bob, let me ask you a question. Have you ever struck out with a girl?" <laughs> and Redford goes, "What do you mean?" <laughs> Nichols says, "This isn't your part." <laughs> um, but yes, once they got into production, then Nichols and Dustin got um, prickly with each other. Yeah. Well, uh, once again, with, with, with um, Nichols, um, Stanley Jaffe, who was sitting here, uh, and I had an experience with Nichols and Elaine May. Oh, my God. And Elaine May, who, of course, was Nichols' partner all those years, uh, and were gr a great team. But Elaine May made a picture called uh, A New Leaf uh, for yeah. Paramount. Which is, and, which is wonderful. And, wonderful. Uh, and, yes, and Stanley and I separate, but a night, yeah, well. separately had the pleasure of saying to Elaine May, um, it was the conversation was sort of like this: really a good picture. We're going to need to cut twenty minutes out of it to make it funny. Whereupon Elaine May responded, "I'm going to sue you," <laughs> and did. Now, cut. Mike Nichols uh, comes to me. Uh, at Paramount, and I did not know Mike, honestly, and I always felt that Mike and I would not get along because of Elaine May. So Nichols is not the sort of person who says, hi, how are you? This is the way studios work. Nichols says, I want you to see The Graduate tomorrow, first cut, and I want one answer from you. I want you to vote, do I need the score of The Graduate? Do I need Simon and Garfunkel? because it's going to cost too much money, and I don't want to have this fight with uh, Joe Levine, who is financing it. I want to avoid the fight. See the movie and tell me, do I need that miserable score? <laughs> so I see it, of course, the next day, and I have, yeah, and since Nichols and I don't get along anyway, I have the pleasure of calling him and saying, you're going to die without that score. Yeah. <laughs> Pay whatever it takes. And he said something to me like, I knew you had given me an answer which would be trouble. <laughs> and, and, of course, he did use the score. It's not a story everyone knows. That's a, that is a rare one. Yeah, yeah, isn't that great? <laughs> and, and, but it's an example, again, of the strange interactions between studio people. And that Mike Nichols, in his own way, as stubborn as he is, sort of knew that studio, somebody at a studio might help you. And that's not what Francis, he would never have had a, 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 a section, he would never have asked a person at a studio, would, would I what do, do you this think? or yeah. what do you think? It, it is an important part of movie history to make a, dis, a, a dividing line between the golden age, the, the studio era, and even though these guys worked in the studio, we don't call it the studio era, we call it a new Hollywood. But that dividing line in the 60s, in the late, late 60s, one of the things that happened was, and this helps to explain the headaches that these guys had to deal with and brilliantly resolve, and the fact that the movies are great is proof that they did, um, is the idea that the filmmaker was an artist was a new idea in this era. Um, the filmmaker working in the golden age d d rarely thought of himself as an artist. He mm -hmm. was a craftsman, mm -hmm. maybe an entertainer, a picture maker. Right. Not, this, this was not art. Um, the, the awareness after what we call the auteur, the auteur theory, Auteur meaning author. This was a concept developed in France in the 50s. The auteur theory came to America 
and filmmakers started to regard themselves as artists. So now they can walk into the bosses with a new moral imperative um, that their an ancestors didn't really have. That combined with the 60s and the, the feeling of I'm going to take down the institutions um, made for a really uh, rich and difficult um, collaboration with these guys, but a healthy one, a healthy one. And again, the proof is, 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 is there in, in, in the movies. Well, once again, I think it takes someone like yourself with an artistic temperament to do a book about, about a, a director, about a filmmaker. And I, I can really congratulate you for this book. I think you did a terrific job of dealing with somebody who is a difficult person and making you, you leave the book with affection and respect toward him. On the other hand, with people like me, a little backlog of uh, indignation. Yeah. Because I, you know, the terrible thing is that people like me really do respect a sense of responsibility. Of course. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's a difficult yeah. desire. <laughs> yes. P Peter, that compliment is that's like Fred Astaire saying that I can dance. So I really appreciate. I really, I really appreciate that. Well, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> thank you.